Hello, we are going to be discussing an update in neuromuscular junction disorders during this session. Our objectives will be to review diagnostic approach to neuromuscular junction disorders, as well as discussing updates in management of neuromuscular junction disorders. And then lastly, review a newer etiology of a myasthenic disorder. So we will have many cases in this presentation. And we start with a case, 21-year-old gentleman presented with a four-month history of intermittent slurred speech and dysphagia. Symptoms were reported to be worsened later in the day. He lost 10 pounds in the two weeks prior to presentation due to difficulty swallowing. He had stopped driving due to intermittent binocular diplopia. And he had stopped exercising because he was tiring too quickly at the gym. He reported no sensory symptoms, and he denied any significant respiratory symptoms. What would you obtain to confirm the suspected diagnosis? A, acetylcholine receptor binding antibody. B, muscle biopsy. C, repetitive nerve stimulation. D, chest CT. E, A and C. And I'll give you a minute to decide your answer and let you know that I would answer in this case E, both A and C, and we will discuss why. So a review on autoimmune myasthenia gravis. Patients will have both symptoms and signs if we take ourselves back to the beginning of medical school. So the symptoms of autoimmune myasthenia gravis include ptosis, binocular diplopia, dysphagia, facial weakness, dysarthria, dyspnea, and proximal more commonly than distal limb weakness. And these complaints can be asymmetric. While we think of the weakness as being symmetric in myasthenia gravis, that is usually in the limbs, but the ptosis is frequently asymmetric. So that's important to keep in mind. And it also can fluctuate between sides. Signs on examination would include the evidence of ptosis, abnormal eye movements, but also fatigable weakness, which is our hallmark clinical finding on examination, and preserved muscle bulk, and in postsynaptic neuromuscular junction disorders, preserved reflexes as well. Now, these are not official, these classification schemes are, are not um, in any kind of official capacity, but they're the three classification schemes that I always use when I'm seeing and evaluating someone with autoimmune myasthenia gravis. So first, I start with, is it